Welcome to the Exploring Unschooling podcast. For countless parents, the journey to unschooling has redefined childhood and transformed their family relationships. Are you curious? Together, let's explore what living and learning looks like without school. Hello, explorers. I'm Pam Larickia, and this is episode number 278 of the podcast. This week, I want to dive into a question that I get pretty regularly, including being mentioned in one of the Q&A questions on the podcast last week. What does unschooling look like in larger families? As we learn more about unschooling, we're encouraged to spend time with our kids, to say yes more, to connect with them more, to answer their questions and help them do whatever they're trying to do to help siblings navigate challenges and conflicts, to explore ways to meet everyone's needs. Add in multiple children, and soon we start to wonder how we're going to build all these strong, connected, and trusting relationships. It seems daunting. I have three kids, but I've had guests on the podcast with four, five, six, seven kids, so I thought I'd bring together some of their wonderful stories, tips, and insights to help parents with multiple children envision what unschooling might look like. And you'll find links to their full episodes in the show notes. But before we dive in, I want to take a moment to thank everyone who has chosen to support the podcast through Patreon. I deeply appreciate all my patrons. Your generous support helps pay for the hosting and transcription, as well as my time spent creating new episodes each week. It's instrumental in keeping the podcast archive freely available to anyone who's curious and wants to explore the fascinating world of unschooling. If you'd like to join my community of patrons and scoop up some great rewards along the way, check out the Exploring Unschooling page at patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash exploring unschooling. And now let's start with Cindy Gaddis. Cindy has seven kids, and at the time of our conversation in 2016, they ranged in age from 15 to 29. Let's listen in as she shares her insights around the conventional idea that the more children you have, the more control over them you need so you don't end up in chaos. Yeah, I wanted to ask you too about what your unschooling days look like with a larger family. You mentioned a bit there. Um, because I know there's the idea that the more children that you have, the more you need to have control over them, you know, so that your day will go more smoothly. So I was wondering what your experience had been. Yeah, my experiences to me with this, I, I thought of two different things. I thought about the emotional side and the physical side. So starting with the emotional side of control, especially with a large family, um, you, you, often think when you see a large family, there's probably a religion involved. A lot of times that's true. It does have to be so with me, not always so, but um, I actually wanted a large family before I converted to my religion. But that said, it seems like people feel like they have to control everyone's behaviors because that's really what it is, is their behaviors have to be out of control. There's too many children, so I have to control them. But on the other hand is if I don't control them, there's going to be other chaos, especially with a mm-hmm. large family. And to me, it's not that there isn't that big uh, pendulum swing. It doesn't have to be one all the way to the other side. There's this middle part where the key is emotional intelligence. Like we all have hunger. We all have thirst. We have, all have need for sleep. And we learn how to manage and balance those things in order to satisfy the needs we have there. Well, we all also have emotions that are really the foundation of the behaviors people are trying to control. And when I felt like, I mean, especially with six boys, uh, boys in particular really need support in how to deal with their emotions. And I help them in various ways by helping them, understand and identify their emotions. I modeled uh, emotional intelligence by helping them to learn various options and managing and balancing those emotions. Um, I think when you look at the adult male population, there's a lot of lack of emotional intelligence. And I think it comes from this whole uh, manly thing that we can't 
sit there uh, and uh, make our kids or boys in particular. I know there's articles out there saying that we're wussifying our, our boys. What's happened to being a, a boy? Um, but, you know, I've raised two very different genetic sets of boys. My birth boys are much more cerebral, and they were born that way. You might call them kinder, gentler types, but that's how they were born. My two younger boys that we adopted are very active and very body-driven boys, and some might call them more manly. But again, they were born that way. It didn't matter what type of boy I was talking about. They had a similar process of learning to manage and balance their emotions. Some came to it more quickly than others, but they all had to develop various skills. It's these reactions to emotional triggers that cause many behaviors. But I wanted to give good information to them, help support them through the learning curve by sitting in the difficult feelings with them, brainstorming better solutions for next time, aiding them in any way, any way that was useful um, so that they could learn how to deal with their strong feelings. It was a process. It doesn't always look pretty. I always had a few friends that were from other faiths, and um, they were all about, you must obey me. And their children, especially between 5 and 10, they looked pretty good. They were all very obedient. Um, mm -hmm. But And mine looked not so great because I valued the process of learning their own bodies. These other people were very uncomfortable with the fact that their children were out of control. So they controlled them with fear or obedience. And I always found that people who did that usually had tr more trouble in the teen years, often didn't have that trust and relationship that comes with collaborating and connecting with them and building that trust with them in this emotional work that we are doing with creating emotional intelligence. I mean, if you go in there and you're not judging them, I mean, we all have it. We all have emotions. We all have feelings that come out. So not to judge that and just empathize with them and say, hey, this is a journey. We are all on it. It's not easy. Let me stand beside you. Let me help you through it. And that is a very bonding experience. In my yeah, I think that's that's such a, that's a huge difference too. And I think, I think what it, it really takes when you look back on it, it is the time, right? It's the time to be with them, the time to help them process the time, just, just to even get um, to the place where you can empathize with them, you know, it, it, rather than there, there is that, um, the, the quickness of do this or else do this or else, you know, the, the obedience demanding the obedience, but it uh, it really makes makes things challenging when they get older, right? And and they have uh, more ability to uh, talk back or or to leave or you know that kind of stuff. Well, to finally have their voice, their own control, that, that, yeah. yeah, their own control, and say, wait a minute, I I want to feel this way, and I don't want you to tell me I can't feel this mm -hmm. way when I do. And you know, it just that's a huge place to build trust. Um, is yeah. to, like you said, empathize with them, go along this human experience with them. And I feel like that's uh, a big shift I have. And I, I'm schooling does it. Actually, my religion is the same way because we believe that we're on this path to learn and grow. That's why we came to earth. That's what we're, our belief system is. And so if we're on this path to learn and grow in an imperfect place, then I get to do this with my children. That, that's the journey. That's the whole reason we're here is to learn and grow from these ways of feeling. And if I'm just squashing them saying, don't do that, don't feel that, then I've lost an opportunity. Uh, yeah. So, you know, you know, you know what? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, as you were talking, what, what, what came to me was, um, the shift at the root of that is really um, the shift to seeing them as 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 real people, as human beings, not as you know something to to form, right? right. Because yeah. it, it, treating them like another person and respecting well, them as another person, it's a, yeah, it's a human condition, and they are young yeah. humans 
trying to figure it out. We are older mm-hmm. humans, hopefully. Still trying to figure it out. <laughs> a lot of us didn't get to figure it out. That's why I said, look at the adult population. I mean, a lot of us are still messes because we didn't have that support. We're just thrown into this and told to figure it out. And we don't figure it out well. And, and, and it's not that I'm saying I figured it out well, but it is, let's, I'm willing to figure out with you that you can have a place that you can um, put your ideas off of and know that you're normal and that you'll get through this and we can problem solve together and trust that we are, we get it, you know, that there's not a judgment here. This is normal. And I feel for you and let's figure this out. And that's a huge shift. I mean, these are people and that hope always invite me on their path and that I feel privileged to be asked to walk along their path with them and that they trust me as a mentor that can help them when they need someone to turn to. So, you know, yeah. to me, that's the emotional side of control within a large family. And then talking about the physical part of a large family where there's lots more messes, lots more bodies, lots more noise, lots more projects, just lots more everything. Um, Go back to, I think again, a little bit of a personal genetic preference stuff. I, I happen to be a lived in kind of person. I I swear people have clean genes or not clean genes. I don't have the clean genes. (laughs) (laughs) Some people get clean genes, then you get, you know, it added on to with your experiences, but I'm in a lived in person. And so that helped. Um, you almost have to assume people with larger families better have that <laughs> idea <laughs> because I can't imagine being a super clean person and then trying to navigate, nav- navigate that with a lot of children, but I don't get stressed over messes and projects going all around me. There is a balance to it. Still, it goes back to individuality I know which of my children are more clean oriented or messy oriented. So I are, I kind of meet them where they're at. If they're messy oriented, I might help them be a little bit better over here, but still respect where they are. And if they're clean oriented, I meet them there. I know who's project based and who's not. I know what each purpose of each project oriented child is, um, how we can work together to create space for them to have their projects that are important to them. I hear people especially a lot there's a lot of clean people in my life <laughs> there's a lot of clean <laughs> people in my life I can go to people's houses and drop in and it's clean and that's crazy in my mind but because I feel like I'm if I'm raising children I'm raising a lot of children I my house reflects that there's children there um and their toys are there, their things are there, and I respect that they need a place to create. I have all these creative kids that that's really important to them. And if I'm going to, and I, I would challenge people who are clean oriented that that is not more important than allowing space for this creation to exist because that is the expression of who they are. Creative people must create. If they cannot create, they are half dead inside. If we are squashing their need to be creative because we're so worried about the mess creation has, then we are are not respecting their need for this expression. You're you're keeping them down from not having that space. If that means, you know, here's this big... uh, Formal living or formal dining room. I don't need a formal dining room. I've got the little nook over here, the breakfast nook. I can convert this dining room area into a space if I need to. Um, We did tend to end up being house poor for quite some time because I have so many introverted children who are very creative and they need their space to create. So we got a big enough house so that I could have space for them and value that. And if that meant I sacrifice the fancy cars or fancy clothes or whatever, I didn't care about that thing, that as much as I did giving this space to them. So that's Mm -hmm. one, 
one aspect of, to me, because like I said, I see, I see a lot of clean houses. <laughs> and I just don't know if that would be conducive to creative children. Anyway, mm -hmm. and another example would be food. I mean, that's talked about a lot in, in unschooling circles. And I'm personally not a person who likes to cook. Um, I did cook a lot of dinners, uh, mainly dinner time. But as soon as my children were old enough to uh, do their own food and make their own breakfast and make their own lunches, they were doing it. So probably by, by, by about five, they were doing their own breakfast. By about seven, they were doing their own lunches. I have one funny story that, uh, that epitomizes this. My oldest son had a friend over to spend the night. He was probably about eight or nine years old. And they woke up and went downstairs to get breakfast. And my son was getting his breakfast. And his friend was sitting in the count at the counter waiting and watching him. And my son noticed him sitting there saying, what are you doing? And he said, um, I'm waiting for your mother to come down and make me breakfast. I'm realizing at this point my son is not a very good host as he's making his own breakfast and leaving his <laughs> friend there. But um, he said, well, you'll be waiting a long time. You have to make your own breakfast in this house he said his friend cried out and said but I don't know how to make breakfast my son was quite shocked he came my my friend doesn't know how to make breakfast mom <laughs> and he was just shocked and I said well you know some people they have those mothers are very good <laughs> actually help them make breakfast every day um but he actually directed his friend on how to make breakfast I thought thought it was interesting that he showed him how versus did it for him. He said, well, this is how you make breakfast. He couldn't believe he didn't know how to go get, you know, <laughs> cereal. <laughs> That's yeah. pretty much what we had. Um, but everyone is different and it does work for me. I release the control of food very early on. Um, it, it works. Um, my kids are very self-sufficient. They eat when they're hungry. We talk about the different foods and it has just worked. So that's another example of releasing the control or what we think should happen. You know, maybe like this mother who, you know, she felt like being a good mother is to wake up and make breakfast for my son every morning to get him off. He was a school child to get him off to school. Well, you know, that's what a good mother does and packs their lunch. And, you know, that's that's our expectation in our society. Now, on the flip side, this kid had no idea how to make breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> so you know there's good and and hard on on both sets of things but this works for us so yeah i think and that's uh that's what we're having a whole episode talking about paradigm shifts because as you come to unschooling we revisit so many of the expectations or you know the things that we've learned growing up of what makes you know, a, a good parent, a good mother, what does success mean to us? You know, it, it's, it's a lot of work coming down schooling, isn't it? It's not just another set of little rules about uh, how children learn. There's, there is so much to the journey, isn't there? <laughs> there is. And, you know, I feel like I'm this natural seeker. I believe unschooling encourages people to be seekers. And once you head down that path, it also necessitates a person to be comfortable being uncomfortable. I was just pondering that the other day. I really feel like being uncomfortable is necessary to become an unschooler because it really is about challenging these paradigm shifts. Mm -hmm. And if you're not, you know, but with all this uncomfortableness, if you're willing to go into that uncomfortableness and figure why, why are you so uncomfortable, then that is where the enlightenment comes from. In my opinion, I'm just, I feel like, so like, oh, this is so awesome. When it's all done, you know, you're first uncomfortable, then you're asking, why am I uncomfortable? Where does this come from? And is it true? And when you find out the answer, the real answer, the truthful answer, it's like, Tada! It's so much, <laughs> I mean, it creates more freedom for yourself. I mean, the freedom from the bondage of our society's expectations is huge, huge. Mm -hmm. I, I'm watching my kids live this. Uh, there's so much self-knowledge. I mean, I feel like I wake up every day wondering, what am I going to discover today? And I expect to be uncomfortable. I expect it because I cannot learn if I have not become uncomfortable first. That's where learning happens is in the discomfort. So I just feel like that's part of 
the journey of unschooling is the willingness to do that. That is such a great point. Yeah. I hadn't thought of it that way, but it's true. You know, it, being willing to um, sit in, in that uncomfortableness for a while and really find out um, what's, what's causing it, you know, asking yourself, I, I, I used to say, I just ask myself, why, why, why over and over again until I could think I could get down to the root and figure it out. Right, that's what, you know. Yeah. Um, before we go, uh, cause it, we have been at this a while. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just wondering if there were any other tips that you'd like to share for larger families who are starting to move to unschooling that we haven't touched on yet. Is there another one or two that you'd like to uh, share? Um, I think, I mean, this goes along with unschooling. Everything's learning. Everything is learning, social, emotional, as well as academic. So, when you feel like you're all busy and you're just trying to make it work for the day, people are, you know, unhappy with each other or whatever, that's still learning. It doesn't matter if there was no math or I didn't read aloud or whatever you think it's supposed to be. In those moments, even in the chaos moments, there's learning happening. Mm-hmm. And so to me, you want to embrace every moment, moment as meaningful and relevant and have those realistic expectations, like uh, give an example, running errands. You know, when you have a whole bunch of children, even if you have a small amount of children, if you're <laughs> thinking I'm going to get four things done and then, of course, you've melted them down because four things is too many or, you know, you're just not going fast. People are not cooperating. Then all you're doing is being angry. You know, you're just being frustrated that it's not happening the way you want But if you can just say, I'm expecting things to go wrong. (laughs) If you Mm -hmm. expect things to go wrong and it not to be perfectly done, then you can enjoy the moment. You know, you can enjoy that first errand and the second errand and be in the moment for those things that will happen that actually are also learning. But the moment you're always trying to get through it or get onto the next thing, you've missed the moments that are there. So I think that in modeling your own passions, even if you have a lot of children, you can find your own space. Again, don't always be looking throughout the day to be annoyed with everyone because they're getting in your way of getting to what you want to do. Embrace what's there. Be in the moment. Find your spots realistically that you can do your things. And probably the last thing would be keep dating your spouse. (laughs) Go out with them weekly because you have to keep connecting together when you have a large family. There's a lot of dividing and conquering when you have a large, large family. You want to come together and prioritize your relationship with your spouse so that they see that and they know that you need refilling and that that relationship is still important, too. Thanks, Cindy. Next up is Tammy Stroud. I spoke with Tammy in 2017, and at the time, her six children ranged in age from 4 to 13. Let's listen in as she shares what their unschooling days look like with the wide-ranging interests of six children and her tips for larger families moving to unschooling. Um, I would like to shift because to two larger families with six kids, I think you have some experience you'll be able to share with us. <laughs> So uh, with the diverging interests, I'm sure, of six children, I would love to hear a bit about what your unschooling days look like, Um, you know, just going through the day and doing X, Y, and Z for everyone, with everyone. Yeah, uh, I I think everybody, all unschoolers have time with this question, what a typical day (laughs) looks like. Um, It, you know, it. For us, especially, it varies depending on what location we're in and how old, you know, what's the age range of the kids and that sort of thing. But I don't know. In general, like, I I kind of have a routine for myself and the kids can kind of, you know, hop on or hop off my routine as they see fit. So, like, I like to 
get up and have my breakfast and stuff like that and do all my sort of self-care things sort of early in the morning. So I'm, I'm good to go for the day. And I, I kind of, I'm super introverted. So like I try to get up and do that kind of quietly by myself and have a, you know, breakfast with nobody else. Like I don't mind hanging out with them when they have their breakfast later in the day, but like I like to have, start my day off with quiet time. Cause that's helpful for me to kind of be my best self. And, and then sort of throughout the day, I kind of have a goal of to kind of have at least one sort of face to face connected check in with each child and kind of hear what they're working on today. Do they need any help with anything and that sort of thing? Um, and, you know, kind of that's kind of tied in with just I like to do also sort of a quiet observation thing and that. I have sort of my, that's part of my sort of routine. And um, for us in general, like throughout the year, I I feel like we have my, since my husband still works in the school, we have, we still are bound by some things with a, a typical school year schedule. But for us, like, I think it's kind of flipped than what like a lot of school kids experience because like during the school year um, our kind of routine is to kind of be really more insular and quiet and sort of like our our day-to-day during the week is kind of really low-key like we do not have a lot going on during the week like the the busiest thing usually during our week when we're home in Riyadh is uh, to do the homeschool day once a week. But other than that, like, we're just kind of low key. And we do, my husband likes to do like some sort of outing on the weekend. So like one day during the weekend, we'll uh, go drive to like some, usually some natural site and see that. Um, And our time during the day, like during the school year, when we have kind of our slow days is, um, during the day before my husband gets home, it's the time is really flexible. My kids, um, most of my kids know how to fix their own meals. I usually help the younger ones fix theirs, but we don't have set meal times during the day. We just kind of, everyone sort of fixes themselves something, uh, when they want to eat during the day. And then we have a, um, a dinner together after my husband gets home in the evenings. And a lot of times, I don't know, we kind of get on a routine and off a routine of like doing regular things in the evenings. Like, um, <laughs> the, one, the one that's stuck is movie night. So yeah, we, we usually will do, have, have a movie night on the, the day before the weekend over there is Thursday. So usually on Thursday nights, we'll, um, have homemade pizza and a movie, But, you know, other than that, sometimes we'll plan things like uh, um, we have a pool in our building, so we'll go swimming one night or do stuff like that. Um, And so, like, during the day, it's kind of really free form and flexible. And then in the evening, it's a little more structured because we have a set dinner time. And a lot of times we'll try to do games or something sort of more planned in the evening with the whole family there. Um, And then... But then that's kind of our our school year routine schedule. And it's it's really low key. Like I'm I really don't like adding things to our schedule. Like people keep asking me about, you know, what all are your kids involved in? I'm like, nothing. We don't I don't want to be involved in anything. Their life is busy enough. This is this is enough. And because during the summer, you know, we're traveling to a bunch of different places and we're, you know, even when we're in the U S like we took a road trip to Washington DC and like, it's a lot, lot more busy during the summer. And so we have these few months where it's super busy. And so I like to like when it's the school year to just have a big swath of time where we like all the activities are sort of, you know, projects around the house and that sort of thing. And like sort of really, really family focused and, yeah, that's kind of how we do things. <laughs> yeah, no, that sounds very nice. <laughs> I, and I think um, that that certainly sounds like our first few years of unschooling too. Um, you know, the kids just had so many things that they just personally wanted to get into. Um, and we didn't have to go out a lot for it, right? Right. I mean, 
there's tons of games and there's just so many things to do at home that they were perfectly happy to have all that time just under their own control. Right, right. And the, and there's always, you know, some art project going on, some big yeah. play scene going on. And, you know, and that's very typical for our house. Or there's some sort of block tower or, you know, that's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, there's like a whole world of, of stuffed animals set up. And yes, <laughs> yes. Pirate, pirate battles and, 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 you know, then there's that two, three weeks in a row where you're making Play-Doh every couple of days because there's this huge yeah. town. And then that there's that one summer when we had the Lego table outside and these <laughs> elaborate villages were built. And, <laughs> and then there's the, all the time with, um, oh, I remember uh, we did, uh, oh, made puppets like uh, Mario and Luigi and all these <laughs> game puppets. And they would just put, um, they would just pause like a background on the TV and then they'd use their puppets and they'd do the, these elaborate <laughs> shows of their own making at the time. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, to to have that uh, time and the space to just like get totally in your head with whatever is catching your attention is awesome. <laughs> um, so, uh, last question. I was hoping that you might share um, some tips for larger families starting to move to unschooling because I know... That's one of the questions I get pretty regularly on my blog, et cetera. Um, you know, because we have uh, four, three, four, five kids, and, you know, I'm trying to say yes more and trying to help them do uh, things that they're interested in, and I, I'm feeling frazzled. They, they um, are having a hard time imagining how to shift from just, telling everybody, you know, yes, no, this is what we're doing to start incorporating um, their input into their days, basically. So I was just wondering if you had any tips for larger families who are starting to move to unschooling. Right. Well, the best way that I've kind of come to think about it is like with, well, when you have a larger family, like you feel in the beginning, you feel like, you know, you're moving an army and that sort of mentality. <laughs> so like, it's hard to kind of get away from just managing everybody and everything. And so like my thought is, is okay. So instead of shifting, you know, shifting away from, you know, managing your children and all these people work on managing yourself and managing the environment. So you really focus on, like for me, I, I focus on self-care is really important because I need to have the energy and the focus and to, to be able to, you know, work with my kids in whatever way they need. So like I've, I've kind of developed sort of strict boundaries about, no, I'm going to sit here quietly. I'm going to get up super early and sit and have a quiet breakfast because kind of that's kind of what I need to, you know, happily focus on the rest of the day. And also managing your environment is really big. Like I work on, I know in unschooling circles, I don't know, talking about minimalism, I don't know. It kind of has kind of a two edged thing. Cause like you want to feed your kids interests, but also, you know, I think a lot of moms, especially in larger families, when you, you times those things times six or more or whatever, that it becomes overwhelming. So I think, I don't know, for me, minimalism has really, or embracing as much minimalism as kind of an American family can stand, <laughs> um, <laughs> it has really helped to kind of simplify things. So like, like during the day, we have one set of dishes for everyone and we rinse and reuse them. So, and I wash dishes once uh, once a day in Alaska, we didn't have a dishwasher. So I like doing it in the morning, but we have a dishwasher now, so you can do it in the, in the evenings and they're ready to go for the next day. Um, and so having kind of less stuff overall has, has helped with that. And like with their wardrobes, like when they were really little, like we would, <laughs> and we weren't even unschooling, but like they would, do what I call the everything must go sale where everything in their drawers got pulled out and onto the floor. So 
like what <laughs> <laughs> what we ended up shifting to was like a lot fewer clothes and just me- and I I don't buy clothes that need folding. I don't, you know, I don't I buy clothes that can be all be washed with different colors, so we don't fold, we don't sort. And then I <laughs> So lots, and I know those things don't sound like they have to do with unschooling, but it sim- simplifies your life and frees you up to focus more on relationships and more on kind of, oh, let's wor- work on this fun project because you don't always have that chatter in the back of your head of, I'm not getting this done. I'm not getting this done. I got to do this. I got to do that. Because, and, you know, in your home, as many wipeable surfaces as you can and that like helps. And I, you know, stash little bottles of vinegar and uh, water in a rag and different places to make it super simple, like for the kids to help clean up, like even if they do it imperfectly, that's kind of way better than not being done at all. So rearranging your house to allow the kids to do as much for themselves, allow them to dress themselves, fix their own food. I mean, like it's going to be done imperfectly, but you know, that's kind of how we learn. And we get to a point where it's, you know, you're like one day, it's like, oh, wow, you're a really good cook. And, you know, <laughs> and that sort of thing. So you facilitate the kids doing kind of as much for themselves as they can. That that has helped. And I also have and well, and depending on which home it is, um, I also do kind of zones, I guess, like, um, like, I, for my bedroom, like I don't, I don't like to keep toy boxes and stuff in there. Like I, I like to keep it kind of very much an adult room and like not sort of a kid room. And so like, I'm kind of particular about that boundary. Like I don't, if a kid comes in there with a toy, I'm not cranky about it, but just in general, like if something's left in there, I'll take it and move it to a room where we keep toys. And this our current house, I do that with the living room also. And so I have like, uh, we're, I'm experimenting with having a few nicer things out on display, which uh, larger families will understand this, that Mm -hmm. yeah, for years, it was just, you know, the joke, we can't have nice things. And so, Mm -hmm. so like, yeah, I have one room that we're, I I put a few things out and we kind of see how it goes. And that room, we don't store toys in. And and again, it's just like if they bring it in there, it's no big deal. And we just take it out at the end of the day and store it in a different room where toys can go. And so kind of having zones helps me to sort of, if this is a zone that I've sort of designated for kids to kind of do their thing in, and it's a mess, that doesn't bother me as much. So, cause I mean, that's what they're supposed to be doing there. And so like in, I can just go sit in the living room where it's <laughs> reasonably tidy because we don't keep toys and stuff in there. And that kind of helps me sort of to be more relaxed about, um, the, the chaos and stuff like that to simplify life. And so I can kind of get in there with them. Yeah. And it makes it easier. I love how Tammy described the shift away from control as instead of managing the kids, managing herself and the environment. Next up is Megan Valmas. I spoke with Megan in 2018, and at the time she had five kids, ages 3 to 13, and they've since added another beautiful child. Let's listen in as she shares her experience with finding ways to meet their diverse needs. (laughs) <laughs> Thank you. With five children, I imagine there are a number of different personalities at play. So I was wondering if you could share your experience around finding ways to meet their diverse needs. Yes, they are all so different. And that is what I find incredible. I feel really fortunate that I've been able to have these five kids. And I used to say, you know, it's crazy how each kid is so different and they have the same parents. And somebody Mm -hmm. once said to me, they don't have the same parent because you are a different or they don't have the same parents because you're a different parent with each child. And that could not be more true in my case, Mm -hmm. because if you look at the mother and that I was and the father's my husband was with Julian and then the parents we are with our youngest Clementine and all in between gosh, like Clementine hit the jackpot. We <laughs> she did. I mean, we have just grown and evolved so much. 
and um, being able to do that with our children has been amazing. And meeting all their needs has been a learning and growing process. And um, in the beginning with unschooling, it was hard for me because I I was still sort of stuck in like, well, everybody kind of should like what I like. If I like it, it must be fun. You guys, don't you yeah, know yeah. that? You know, <laughs> like, why wouldn't you want to go to the park day? And my oldest son um, is it totally his own. I mean, all my kids are totally their own person, but he's always been much more introverted than my three. Well, I've kind of got three extroverts and two introverts. And so my oldest and my fourth child are very introverted, as is my husband. And I'm more extroverted, if you haven't noticed. And um, <laughs> my, I've got my two middle kids are, and then my youngest are more extroverted. And so I really had to learn that it's okay for them all to be different and that my, my second and third child – love doing classes. They want to try anything. They'll go to a park day. Anything I throw at them, they're usually willing to try it. Um, my oldest hates classes. Ever since he, we pulled him out of school, he's tried a few classes here and there at my urging. Because, you know, in the beginning, mm-hmm. when you first start unschooling, you're like, wow, look at all these classes. Let's sign one up yeah. for every day. And then we'll go to 12 park days a month. And we'll do, you know, we're going to meet all these people. And it's like, <laughs> that, that really didn't work for our family. And I kind of learned that quickly. Um, and that was part of learning to trust my son and knowing that he knew what was best for him. He just doesn't like park days. And that was hard for me to understand in the beginning. Cause I thought, don't you want to make friends? And, and he was making a lot of friends online, you know, mm-hmm. but I was sort of discounting that. And, um, so now how I meet their diverse needs really is by just like we talked about before, connecting into each individual one and figuring out things that we can do that everyone will like because there are those things that we all love. We love doing things as a family. So usually if it's all seven of us, everybody's in. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. we went to Knott's Berry Farm this past Sunday, which is an amusement park here for my son's birthday. Any amusement parks everybody always wants to go to. <clears throat> um we love traveling together. And when we travel, it's a really great time for us all to connect as a family. We just kind of do a lot of stuff together. You know, we go mm-hmm. surfing or hiking or exploring or whatever. And um, and everybody's game for that. But when we're at home, which is usual, my son really, he's, he's sort of on the gamer schedule, the vampire schedule, which, you know, <laughs> wakes up around four in the afternoon and then goes to bed at an undisclosed hour. I'm not really sure (laughs) when it is, but I know it's late or early. And he, and then when he really wants to do something, he he does, but I I'll go watch him play his video games if he wants. And he lets me know what he needs, right? Like he Mm -hmm. he'll say, Oh, I want to go to the mall. He likes going to the mall now, or I want to go get this game. So I think the biggest way of meeting needs is by staying connected to your kids and knowing who your kids are, Mm -hmm. which is huge because there are certain things I know my oldest son and my fourth child, my two introverts are not going to like. And so we talk, I talk, I always run everything past everyone, but I don't get offended or take it personally if they don't want to do it. And I, the option to say no is always available. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how we are. You know, the, right now, my son just got, my younger son just got a Nintendo Switch for his birthday. And so that mm-hmm. has been so much fun because everybody can play and we all love it. Yeah. So we're all playing Just Dance and it's hilarious. And, you know, they're all playing Mario Kart. So that's something bringing all the kids together, except for Clementine. I mean, she stands there with a remote thinking she's playing, but <laughs> <laughs> she's not quite there yet. So that's it. I feel, I feel like, um, yeah, meeting needs is just really an extension of staying connected. Connected. Yeah. Yeah. Cause then, then, you know, and well that and being okay with no. Right. Right. That's, that's the other huge piece when you're connected and, and then it's just, just figuring it out, isn't it? Just trying to see how you can weave all the different things yeah, together. Yeah, it's just life, and it just really starts yeah. to flow. And I think whether you have 
one kid or you have five, like obviously the workload increases a little bit, I think, but <laughs> you know, but whether it, it's not even, I think good on schooling, it just, it hits a flow and there are ebbs yeah. too. But what mm-hmm. I actually, I've been discussing an ebb with a good friend of mine. We were talking about the ebbs and she said something really beautiful that, you know, during the ebbs, the tide is pulled away and there's all these unexpected treasures on the sand on, uh-huh. on the beach that you can find, you know? And mm-hmm. that made a lot of sense to me because sometimes like everything, we're all flowing so well and everything's going great. And then we feel like we start to ebb and it's like, okay, what's going on? But taking that downtime, which is really kind of what it is mm-hmm. and looking for the treasure in it. Maybe everybody, you know, needed a break. I think we get so caught up. Another cultural thing is getting caught up with being busy, because if we're yeah. busy, then we're worthy. You know, we're yeah. that, that means that we're productive human beings and we're worth our weight in gold. And gosh, darn it, we're going to make the world a better place. And it's, <laughs> like, you know, sometimes being productive all the sometimes it's really OK that downtime. Your brain needs it. Your body needs it. Kids absolutely need it. And they know how to give it to themselves naturally. Mm -hmm. You know? Yes, I'm still learning They really do. I'm learning how to give myself downtime. That has been another big piece that came with unschooling, which is huge. Yes. The value of downtime was a big aha moment for me, too. And I love the image of unexpected treasures on the beach to help remind ourselves of the value of those quiet times. Thanks, Megan. Next up is Talia Bartow. I spoke with Talia in 2019, and at the time, her four children ranged in age from one to nine. And what's extra fun is that Talia will be back on the podcast in a couple of weeks to check in with us. I'm really excited to share our conversation. For now, let's listen in as she shares some tips on navigating her unschooling days with four young oh, children. Oh, you mentioned four kids and you shared a great example there. I was um, hoping you might share some tips on the way you guys navigate your unschooling days with four young children. Because, you know, that is something that comes up often in the questions and I get questions about. Uh, so... Any tips? What what works for you? Like how how you approach those those days, those moments, really, right? Oh yeah. Um, well, I would say I'm still still constantly learning. You know, I would Google too, like unschooling multiple children. You know, <laughs> yeah. I feel, I feel like they're I, right there in the thick of things. But learning to be flexible and adaptable has been something that is not naturally to my nature, but it's something that's offered us a lot of benefit. Expectations for, for me, I'm the planner, you know, I'm organized. I research it ahead of time. I know every single thing I know this route and I know a backup route and a backup route and I plan it and I expect it and it goes good. But when you have kids, there's only so much planning you can do because they wake up and they didn't sleep good or uh, they just didn't feel good or their breakfast isn't right or they're just having a day where your plans that you just spent a really long time putting together didn't work or you get there and they're like wait this activity is kind of lame mom you know and you're like wait but I planned it and I knew the outcome I knew how it was going to go because I researched it so learning that I, my expectations can be relaxed and let go because the most important thing is that we're connected, that our day is as peaceful as it can be, which sometimes that's a lot. And sometimes it's not going to be a lot, but as it can be by learning to let go of the outcome by saying, okay, my plans are this, but we can switch that to another day having people in our lives that understand last minute, Hey, we're having an off day. Uh, we can switch this to next week. And they're saying, yeah, okay. Because we do the same thing for them. And just knowing that I can't control the outcome, which is mighty schooling the control stuff, but it has made such a difference in our day when I just know that, that I can let that go and we can still have a good day. And it's not a bust because I had to reschedule our plans and the kids are learning by watching that it's okay that they can say, honestly, nope, not happening today. And that it's not the end of the world, that plans change, that things adapt, and that that makes our days go a lot smoother for us. 
Yeah. For, for me, I remember that, that little revelation, because I was a big planner. Oh, I still am a big planner. I'm like already in the midst of planning our November trip. <laughs> and it's yeah, I relate. I relate. <laughs> I, I so relate. Yeah, but for, for me, yeah, exactly, right? But for me, what, what changed was the outcome is the plan. Rather the yes. out, rather than the outcome being the execution of the plan, right? Yes, I, the journey. It's <laughs> exactly yes. like the, these are the things in my backpack for the journey, and it's just one of the things. That's that's a great way to look at it, right? And that because that that other thing you mentioned, the flexibility, right? That these are the the plans, and I don't even at this, I don't even like put date days on them. As in, yeah. you know, like this, these things will flow together nicely into a day and these things will flow together nicely into a day. And it's like, when we wake up in the morning, what's the weather? How are people feeling? Which of these days do we want to live today? Which you know, I would have never imagined that that's where I'm at. I used the phrase, oh, we'll play it by ear the other day to my mom. And my mom was like, I thought I knew you. But then you <laughs> play it by ear. And I'm like, I have to, I have to, I'm evolving you know, I'm evolving. It's not easy, but I'm doing it. <laughs> and it's like, okay, all right. So yeah, I don't know what day we're seeing fireworks. I got four different options of days because I have to play it by ear. It's okay. It's not easy, but it's okay. So we go with the flow. And then if we don't go with the flow and the days get messed up and I make a mistake or the kids are tired and grumpy and I, I apologize, you know, learning how to apologize which I do more than I ever thought that I would do, I learned, it has made a difference. Like, okay, you know what? I really did push on those plans too hard and everyone got grumpy and that was avoidable. So apologize, learn from it and try to take it to the next time and not repeat the same things. They, that's a big thing. Like, I don't think a lot of people apologize to me or my siblings and cousins. That wasn't a lot we heard from adults, you know, which is just, I guess the time that wasn't something that people talked about, but I think it's really important. And if you have four kids and everything's busy and loud, you're going here and you're getting overwhelmed, you're going to do things sometimes. And then you need to apologize a lot, often, every time. Yeah. Well, because I mean, to me, that helps with the whole um, connection, the trust, building the trust, right? Um, it's not about trying to be a perfect parent, right? It, it, yeah. Just give that dream up. Bye. <laughs> Bye. In the Bye. box with the things in the body. <laughs> it is stuck in that box there. Just to be so much more open that, that we are individuals with likes dislikes and things that go wrong and and we're part of that too and and seeing like you're it's a great example um even to your kids that we can do things that when we look back it's like huh you know I can see how that contributed to the challenges that we ended up with and I'm sorry about that and you're you totally are. You're honest and you're learning from it. And yes, it may happen again and again, a few times till, you know, that lesson sinks deep enough in so that you catch it before you do it. Like yes. I find for me, that's something I just catch it a little quicker and a little quicker and, a little, and then eventually I catch it before I do it completely. You know what I mean? It's not an on off switch, right? right? It's not, it's not this simple A and B black and white point. There's so much gray area. And I'm like, my, my brain, my roof all our brain was like, man, why is there so much gray area? But there is, and you know, you just go with it and you accept it because if you fight it and you resist it, then it's just, who needs more resistance? Mm -hmm. We know we need more connection and resistance does not breed connection. So we just have to, you accept it. Where is that? Yeah. Oh, I love that. I love that. It's so, it's so true. And then, and then they see it by example and, and they see that it's not something to be ashamed of. Yeah, it's not. Right? It's okay to be wherever you're at, whether that's, you know, at the beginning of your journey or the middle or the end, or if you're in a busy season or if you're in a slow season, learning that they're all a part of the process. I like to be in a busy season. Sometimes it's fun to post pictures on Instagram when you're like, oh, we went to the aquarium, we went to the amusement park. And, but it's also okay to not 
be in that season. I had my fourth baby, you know, last year, and our last year was a lot slower than the years before because that's where we're at. And our days are so much people when we accept that that's where we're at. And there's nothing wrong with having more days of YouTube and Minecraft and reading books and making Play-Doh versus those aquarium and amusement park days you know you accept where you're at and as long as you're partnering and you're keeping the conversations going and you're connecting that all of those seasons are okay you just honor what season you're in and things flow better and you have to apologize less too yeah that's right that's right no i love i love that word seasons i hadn't really thought of it as as seasons but how when you look back and you see the flow and you yeah. say, oh, well, you know, that's why we were a little busier then. That's why we weren't so much then, you know, the seasons around bigger changes, like having a baby yeah. or moving or things like that, you know, the focus and the flow changes um, to adapt, really, right? Yeah. But as you said, when you're keeping the conversations open and everybody knows what's going on, it's not a surprise, you know, and if yeah. if somebody wants a bit more of something, we do what we can to help them figure it out a different way, right? Right. We were in this season where we were already taken kind of slow, and then it was winter time. And winter is always a little slower. You spend we spend more days indoors, and then we had some vehicle issues, so we went down to one vehicle for a few months, and it was like the worst timing with the winter already being there and my husband needing to take the vehicle to work. So every day, I would ask each kid when they woke up, we'd have our morning cuddles, and I would say, "Is there something you want to do today?" And if they would say, "I really want to play Roblox with you today," or "Can we go ahead and make slime today?" and I would try my best to incorporate and our days each one because I couldn't take them out of the house when papa was at home even if they wanted to but I still wanted to make their needs a priority so I would ask you know and we would keep that conversation going and we made the boat the best of the situation that we had and we made it through and we had a lot of good days a lot of good home days yeah no that's great I love that that approach and I I've done that I would do that too a lot with the kids um when they got up you know, in that little transition, quiet time, you know, is there anything in particular you want to make sure that we do today or, you know, that kind of stuff. Just be, it's a nice touch point. It shows, you know, you're thinking of them and, and it helps you help them have, have a good day. Right. I, I mean, right? even if, like even okay, five people in a house all day, sometimes there's, you know, yeah. some big emotions and feelings and everyone needs their own space. So if you say, you know what, I don't want to do anything today, but mostly I just want to chill away from my brother. And I'll be like, OK, yeah, do you want me to set you up in your room with a movie and some popcorn? That's OK. Exactly. Three days, I get it. I get it. <laughs> That's totally it. Right. And then. And then as the day starts too, it also helps you um, have things for some of those transition moments, right? Yes. It's like, oh, is now a good time to make this line? Right. Right. Okay. You know, it, yes. and it, now it fills your back and we that's a great time to uh for me to play roblox with you because the baby will be napping and i can totally focus on that and this is what time approximately we'll do that you know and yeah. then they know and i follow through which helps them build that trust that they know okay i told mom i wanted to play roblox but then we have it in three weeks you know that doesn't happen i try my best to follow through and then they trust that i will and so they honor that we're doing the best that we can because we do I love how Talia described herself now as someone who says things like, we'll play it by ear, <laughs> and the value of apologies, and follow through. Beautiful. Thank you, Talia. And finally, let's hear from Kate and Jenna Phillips. I spoke with them last year, so in 2020, and they had six children who, at the time, ranged in age from 3 to 15. They share some great tips about navigating life with six kids. So I was curious if you guys could share some tips about just navigating your days with six kids. <laughs> you know, there are people with larger families. I get, I get, uh, you know, questions pretty regularly about that because, you know, when you're trying to meet your kids' needs and you've got a larger number of kids, it, it can be hard to kind of figure out your way through that. I think part of it is too because you're, you know, you kind of see your kids as silos. And I've got six kids and they've got six different interests. You know, how am I going to fit that right. into my day? So I thought it would be great if you guys could share a bit about that. 
definitely. We've been asked this a lot by uh, quite a few families who mm. have embarked on homeschooling journeys. Um, and like, okay, so tell me how you do it with six kids. So we kind of have the answers down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah. And it's really about teamwork. So if I say, you know, the kids really want to go to the waterfalls for the day. And so, I'll, okay, I'll wake you guys up at 10. I'll make sure we're out the door. This is important to you. And I wake them up at 10 and they're just kind of, oh, but they want to go. But I know before I go, I need to feed the dog or the dogs need to be fed. Not that I need to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, the dogs need to go out. We have to take care of the cats. We have to do certain things. And they're all just sitting there. In any normal situation, I think a parent would say like, I'm doing all of this for you guys so we can go somewhere and you're doing nothing and you get angry and resentful and, and I've been there and she's been there mm -hmm. and it doesn't feel right. So we really take a teamwork approach. Hey, the night before, if you guys want to go, great, but this is what we'll have to do. Just remember. And now mm -hmm. we've done that so many times that they tell us, so they'll say, Hey, tomorrow we all want to do this. I'll, they make a plan. Mom, we'll wake you up at 10. Or I'm going to go to bed by midnight because I, I yeah. think if I need, I need like nine, like Luca literally said this last night. Like I, I like like nine hours of sleep. Yeah. But so, I want to be up um, and I need to be able to help you. I'll do the dogs and they'll say like, can you do the cats? And it really is just focusing on that teamwork. And that's if we have a plan for the day and we need to do something. And so if there's not a plan and we're just in the house, um, we just ask, what do you want to do today? What are you feeling? Because it's really about some days you feel academic and some days you feel lazy and some days you want to go explore. And, and when they have different avenues that they want to take, um, it gets a little tricky, but luckily we're really blessed that Kate works from home. So when they, we have two or three kids that want to stay home, great, stay home. She's here if you need anything, right. but they're pretty self-sufficient. Um, I'm going to take the ones that want to go out and we're going to go do this. And maybe one of them that wants to go to the waterfalls and the other one really wanted to go to the museum. So we compromise, like, you know, we're going to go to the museum first and get some books on the waterfalls. And then we'll spend like an hour there on the way home at the waterfall or whatever. Um, so it's really just, again, back to respect, trying to respect our own boundaries and needs for the day while giving what they need to them mm -hmm. um, and having them do the same for us. Um, if it's a day at home and I'll say, okay, well, you know, what do you guys want for breakfast? We all go in and usually one of us will make breakfast. One of us will do the dishes. We'll sit down and eat, talk about what we're going to do and just take our own paths. It's just a well-oiled machine at this point. <laughs> But it wasn't, it's never like, you have to unload the dishwasher. It's, okay, well, if you want me to make omelets, the dishwasher, all the pans are in the dishwasher. Who wants to do that real quick? And then I want omelets. So, the, you know, they raise their hand, like, I'll do it. <laughs> and then the little kids are really interested in cracking the eggs. So they're like, ooh, I want to help. Right. And it's just, yeah, it's easy at this point. Yeah, but you, it, you have, you have to hold, not hold on to it too tightly, right? You have to. You have to release your expectations unless they're super important to you, you know, but like if they don't feel fuel your your desires, then you need to release them. You know, like and go with the flow because um because there isn't no other option. <laughs> like, you know, uh, you otherwise you're just disappointed people. a lot. <laughs> right. And if you disappoint your kids and then you feel like a failure that night and then you go to sleep with that energy, it's just you know, that's a cycle that you're going to dive into and, and it, you're going to feel like a failure and most likely you're going to fail and you're going to have, you know, you're going to be depressed or it's just going to lead to a somewhere you don't, a dark place. Mm -hmm. And so we really try to just live joyfully in the moment. So if this is a day where, oh, I'm just exhausted, but the kids really want to do this, I tell them, I could probably go for a couple of hours. So instead of taking the two hour trip to that hiking place, could we just like go somewhere locally? I'm really tired and I'm going to sit under a tree while you guys explore. And so I'm still getting what I need, but they're getting what they need. Um, 
And if they have questions, great. But they're like, oh, mom's tired and she's just resting under the tree. I'm going to answer my own questions now or save them for later. Mm -hmm. And it's just that respect that we've all have in our foundation. Yeah, well, I, I think it, it really does go back to, like you talked about, the focus for those first couple of years on the interpersonal relationships, right? right? Like that truly does set the foundation where you can more easily navigate all these moments because you know, respectfully and because everybody feels heard and understood and, and communication skills are, are up there and, and being able to, like you said, share your needs and have them be part of the mix as you figure out a way through it, right? In how everybody is today. And that, that go with the flow thing was always such a big thing too, but you learn that by not going with the flow enough times, you know, and trying to like, this is your plan, we're going to do it, you know, and, and then realizing how you feel at the end of the day, which is horrific and nobody really enjoyed it anyway. It's like, oh yeah, that wasn't. Yes. Right. <laughs> right. And then, you know, unfortunately we still have those times. I still have those moments that take over and. Kate actually is a lot better at reading her own needs and my needs and saying, no, like you didn't sleep well. You're exhausted. We just got back from vacation. They don't need to go today. They just want to, but they'll be fine. Tell them what you need. And I, I have a hard time stepping back from that role of giving and that's something like that she's like the ultimate caretaker. Right. So like if she cares from, two or three of her of her kiddos you know that they want to do this that that like desire to to give them to and push my own needs away is overbearing yeah and I have to sometimes remind her like whoa remember like which is your tank is not full right now so yeah fill your tank first and And, tell them that and I think having a support person to do that is key when you are unschooling um, whether that be a partner, a parent, a best friend, an older child that you've developed that relationship with that can read you, um, or if you're, you know, you're really in tune with yourself and good at it, but like, if you are a primary caregiver, having someone being a, telling you like, no, it's okay, it's okay to take this time is key. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like, you know, that role of caretaker, caregiver, to include yourself in that mix, right? Yeah. We we see our kids and we're putting it all, you know, we want to um, do all we can with and for them, right? But it, uh, that mental shift to put ourselves also in that yeah. mix, it's, it's, it's a hard one. So like you said, it is so good to be able to have someone else who can help point us point that out to us when it looks to them like we are you know erring on the side and even if we still choose to do it taking that moment to realize that we're getting low in energy or you know whatever it is and to realize okay I'm choosing to do this but tomorrow I'm really going to need to take that down day yes yes yeah and expressing that and, right. and really respecting it for yourself so you don't feel like a failure and so that your kids really understand I'm giving this to you but tomorrow I really I really need this and this is this is what I need to keep doing this to keep thriving and, yeah. and uh-huh. I respect it. Uh-huh. <laughs> so and I think also, you know, I mean like I don't want to go I mean we're just two humans you know but I think it's it's interesting. Um, it's an interesting aspect that we're both women, and we can understand um, the the ebbs and flows of being a, in a female body, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, there's there is a difference in you know how our cycles and how our energies work, you mm-hmm. know, um, as females than as and we uh, both identify um, she her, so that we really embody that female cycle both right. of us really strongly do yeah mm-hmm. and so but we're able to like you know say to each other you know like I, I I'm gonna have my period soon so I know my energy is gonna be down and like we know exactly what that means you know it's not like 
but we we're teaching you know we have um mainly boys we have four boys we have three boys, oh, three boys. two girls and a non-binary kiddo um and so we are teaching all of them that even you know if it's a menstrual cycle or it's your energy is low you you need to say that and then respect that your body does take over sometimes you know and you have to go with that yes um and so we do teach the kiddos and they will say mom are you tired today or do you have your period like what's going on and really respecting the human body for what it is and what might be happening mm -hmm. in that and in the mental shift that you talked about mm -hmm. what else is going on yeah yeah oh, so great looking at energy right like they can they can feel yeah. our energies right and to to bring that out and talk about that because those are real aspects in our lives they're all part of the flow of 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 what we can do in our days right so understanding that piece is so helpful and really going back to that support person and i and I do mean that, you know, you don't need another, you don't need to be married to a woman for a, to, to be understood. <laughs> you don't need to have a, a partner. Our 12 year old is at the point where, where they will notice my exhaustion level and say, I think you need to go in your room for a couple hours. I'm going to take, you know, the five, baby who's five out to, to play. That was such a great example of adults and kids alike getting to know each other and just helping each other out as things come up. The teamwork they spoke of at the beginning isn't just about the physical things that need doing, but mental and emotional aspects of living as well. So beautiful. Big thanks to Cindy, Tammy, Megan, Talia, Kate, and Jenna for sharing some of their stories and experiences around unschooling with larger families. I hope you found it interesting to hear these snippets side by side. And there are more podcast guests that we didn't hear from today who are unschooling with four or more kids. Sometimes we just didn't speak specifically about that aspect of their lives. But because this is a pretty common question, I put together a new page on my website about unschooling in larger families that includes links to those conversations as well. So if you want to dive deeper, listening to their unschooling stories, just knowing that they have multiple kids can definitely be helpful. And I will share the links to that in the show notes. Have a wonderful day. I hope you found this episode helpful on your unschooling journey. And be sure to check out the growing podcast archive. The conversations never go out of date. You can find more information about my books, the Living Joyfully Network online community, and the Childhood Redefined Unschooling Summit online course at my website, livingjoyfully.ca.